In this tutorial, I'll show you how to overhaul your classic renderer by upgrading it to a physical based renderer. So what exactly distinguishes a classic renderer from a physically based one? Well, there isn't an official set of traits that a PBR shader should have, but here are some commonly accepted ones. First of all, energy must be conserved in a PBR model. For example, in something like the Blin Fung algorithm, you can see that I can easily increase the size of the specular light while still having it keep the same intensity. This should not happen. Instead, the specular light should have a lower intensity as it covers a larger area. Secondly, the PBR model should be based on a microfacet model, which assumes that surfaces are made of microscopic faces that perfectly reflect light. It's just that if they're not well aligned, then at a macroscopic level, they will appear to imperfectly reflect light and thus give the surface a rougher look. The less rough a surface is, the more it is mirror-like, and vice versa. And the third requirement would be that of the Fresnel effect, which says that the lower the viewing angle on a surface is, the better the reflection is. You can easily notice this if you look at your laminated floor. You will notice that reflections further away from you are more clear than the ones close to you. This is because the viewing angle becomes shallower as the distance increases in the case of a flat plane. This effect can be seen on a sphere by noticing the intensity of the specular light changing as the angle to the surface gets smaller. Keep in mind, these are more like guidelines. You will see that in some cases they are not fully followed and the model is still considered PBR. Okay, now that we know some of the requirements for PBR, let's see how we would go about implementing them. I present to you the rendering equation. Please don't run away yet, we'll simplify it and break it down into smaller bite-sized equations. We'll start by removing the time and wavelength variables since we won't be using them. Now, to make it more friendly, I'll replace these fancy Greek letters with something a bit more familiar. So now, let's look at what this equation is actually saying. On the left side of the equal sign, we have the outgoing light that will hit the camera, aka the final color. Then the first variable on the right side is the emitted light of the object, so something like the light that hot metal produces. And now we get to the scary integral. As you may know, integrals sort of work like sums of infinite amount of things that are infinitely small. In this case, the integral adds up all the lights that are within the top hemisphere of a point X on our mesh. Luckily for you and me, in this tutorial, we'll only be using a limited amount of lights that are infinitely small, so each source would only contribute light down a single direction. In other words, a bye-bye integral welcomes scary Greek sum symbol. Now, we'll skip the first function because it's the most complicated one, and instead we'll look at the second function, which is just the incoming light. If you're using directional lighting, then this would simply be the color of your light. But if you're using point lights or spotlights, you also need to take into account the inverse square law of light intensity. Now, the final part of the equation should look familiar to you, since it is present in more old-school algorithms like Fong and Bling Fong lighting. This simply makes the outgoing light less bright when the angle between the surface and the incoming light is shallow, since the intensity of the light gets stretched across a larger area thanks to the angle. Okay, now let's go back to the function we skipped. This function is called the Bidirectional Reflectance Distribution Function, or BRDF for short. This is the main function that brings all the PBR qualities to our shading, and it looks like this. On the left side of the addition, we have our diffuse lighting, while on the right side, we have our specular lighting. KD and KS represent the fractions that each type of lighting contributes to the final outgoing light. Because PBR should conserve energy, these two should add up to 1, aka 100%. If they're above that, energy is created from nowhere. Well, if they're below that, it's not that bad because you could see that energy is transformed into heat, but it's still undesirable. Now, as you might remember, the Fresnel effect dictates the amount of specular reflection that takes place, so Ks would simply equal the Fresnel factor, while Kd will equal 1 minus Ks. 
The Fresnel function is this, where F0 represents the base reflectivity of a material, so the reflectivity it has when the viewing angle is perpendicular to the surface. And the halfway vector is just that, the vector that is halfway between the view and light vectors. Now for the diffuse lighting, we have two choices that I am aware of. One is the Lambertian model, while the other one is the oren nayar model. The oren nayar model gives more realistic results, but it's also more computationally expensive, so the Lambertian model is usually preferred for real-time graphics, historically speaking. We'll look at the differences between these two in another video. For now, we'll go with the Lambertian model for its simplicity. The function is simply the color of the object divided by pi times the dot product between the normal of the surface and the incoming light. But since we already have this dot product present in the rendering equation, we can omit it. As for the specular lighting, we'll be using the cook torrens or torrens sparrow equation. Not sure which is the correct name, people seem to use them interchangeably. In any case, this is what it looks like. If you'll google it, you might come across three different variations of it. One where there is no constant in the denominator, one where there is a 4, and one where there is a pi. The correct version is the one with the 4. In the original paper in which the equation appeared, there was nothing in the denominator, but that error was later corrected. Sometimes pi also appears in the denominator because some people like to put it there instead of in the d function as we will see later. In any case, as you can see, this function is further composed of three more functions. d is the normal distribution function, g is the geometry shadowing function, and f is the Fresnel function, which we are already familiar with. Now, since we're using the cook torrent specular lighting function that contains the Fresnel function, we need to get rid of the KS term, since otherwise we'd be duplicating the Fresnel effect. So, let's take a look at the normal distribution function. Yet again, we have multiple choices such as the Beckman model, the GGX Trowbridge Wrights model, or the GGX Anisotropic model. I'll be using the Trowbridge Wrights model in this video, but feel free to use another model. So, this is the function. And just as I promised, there is a pi in the denominator here. This could of course be removed from here and be put besides the 4 from before, if you so wish. The alpha variable we see here is equal to roughness squared. What this function basically does is to describe how the microfacets of the point we are on are distributed according to their roughness. On the other hand, we have the geometry shadowing function. There are again multiple models, such as the Newman model, the Kellerman model, the Smith model, and the Schlick Beckman model. We are going to use a combination of the Smith and Schlick Beckman models that is called the Schlick GGX model. The Smith model takes into account two types of geometrical shadowing interactions geometry obstruction, where the camera can't view a lit point that it would normally be able to see and geometry shadowing, where the light ray isn't able to reach the camera. Now, both of these will use the same equation, which will be the Schlick-Beckman function. The only difference is that for one we'll use the view vector, while for the other one we'll use the light vector. The k variable will be equal to alpha over 2 in our case. Notice that online, you may find people using roughness plus 1 all squared over 8. This is because Disney and the Unreal Engine 4 were using this variant in the past, but now they've reverted to the alpha over 2 variant as far as I know. Now the last equation is the Fresnel function, but we already looked at that, so that concludes the rendering equation, hooray. Here is an overview of the whole thing. So let's see how we would go about implementing this in code. Here I'll be using pseudocode that looks somewhat similar to the C syntax. Keep in mind, I won't be optimizing the code, that is something that is left up to you to do. Some general rules when implementing this is to prevent all negative dot products by having zero as a minimum value, and also to prevent divisions by zero by, again, having a minimum value. 
The reason we don't want negative dot products is that they only occur when the vectors are outside of our top hemisphere and anything outside the top hemisphere is ignored in this model. So to start off, you want to make sure you have the following in your fragment shader. The world position of the fragment you are on, the normal of the fragment, the position of the camera, the position of the light source, the color of the light source, the albedo slash color of your mesh, the emissivity of your mesh, the roughness of your mesh, and the base reflectance of your mesh. Of course, if you're using directional lighting, then the position will represent the light vector of the light, not its position. Now we need a main for vectors we'll be working with. First, the normal vector, which we get by normalizing the normal. Keep in mind that vertex normals become shorter due to interpolation between vertices and if you don't normalize them, you will get these types of results. Next, we want the view vector, which we can get by normalizing the difference between the camera position and the fragment position. Then we want to get the light vector, which we get by normalizing the light position in the case of directional lighting and by normalizing the difference between the light position and fragment position in the case of point lights and spotlights. The final vector we need is the halfway vector, which is obtained by normalizing the addition of the view and light vectors. Now we will need an equation for the normal distribution function, in this case the GGX drawbridge rights model. Notice how I keep all dot products above zero and I also prevent the division by zero. Next, if you're using the Schlick GGX model, you'll want a function g1 which takes in a vector that will be either the view or light vector. Then you want a function g which multiplies two g1 functions, one with the view vector and the other with the light vector. The last helper function will be Fresnel's equation, which you've seen before. Really straightforward stuff. Now for the actual rendering equation. We'll start by calculating the value of Ks and Kd. Then the Lambert equation and the cook torrens equation. Using all these variables, we can now get the BRDF. Don't forget to omit the Ks if you're using cook torrens for specular lighting. And now we can simply plug all the variables we have into the final rendering equation and get the final color. The final result should look something like this. Okay, there's just one more thing I would like to add to this model and that is a metallic variable. The special thing about metals is that they only reflect specular light, no diffuse light. So it's actually really easy to implement this in our shader. We simply have to multiply the KD variable by one minus the metallic value. Don't forget to also change F0 manually by looking up the base reflectivity of the metal you wish to render or interpolate between some F0 and the albedo of your mesh using the metallic value. Just keep in mind, your metals won't look that good without image-based lighting, but we'll look at that in another tutorial. Here is an overview of the final pseudocode where you can plug in any equations that you want to use. I've left some questions at the end of this video so you can test your understanding of the subject. If you have any questions, drop a comment below or join my Discord server down in the description. I would like to thank my Patreons without whose support I would not have been able to increase the quality of my videos to this level. If you want to see more content from me, feel free to join their ranks. That was it for this video, you can find all resources I've used down in the description. Bye!